Gene Hill, of course, uh, as you know, had uh, some serious car trouble, could, could not get it fixed. So uh, we had to make a replacement here. It turns out that the uh, American-made model just didn't work. So we got a foreign model. <laughs> now, even though Keith uh, Ken was uh, born in the UK, foreign model, he uh, made amends by uh, marrying a Texas girl. That resolves all. So you're redeemed. <laughs> <laughs> Ken has been very active. He's, he uh, really originally started preaching when he was in Australia. Preached there for a few years and went back to the UK for a while and, and a little interlude there to come and, you know, got a Texas girl and went back to England. <laughs> but he's, uh, he continues to go back to England uh, every year, a couple times a year, I guess, don't you? A couple, this will be the 20th year. 20th year, one back to England to preach for the brethren there, so uh, they depend on him, and, and uh, he currently preaches for the Belvedere Church of Christ, and that's right in South Carolina, but right close to Georgia line, right close to Augusta where they play the golf, that's right, yeah, that's right, so he's been there for uh, about 12 years, I guess now, so doing a good work there, and, and I know they appreciate him, and uh, trying to keep the church faithful in that area. We, we appreciate that. Uh, he and Linda, his wife, have uh, three children, Stephen and Thomas and Ellen, and uh, has, uh, what, uh, how many grandchildren do you have now? Seven and one on the way. How many? Seven and one on the way. That makes eight. We'll be eight. Yeah. How come I only got three? <laughs> I, I, I need... <laughs> I need to talk to the, uh, the source of the problem now. I know. I know. But uh, uh, yeah, Ken has graciously uh, uh, offered to replace uh, Gene Hill, and we appreciate that. And it's, it, it was on very short notice, and, but he, of course he had a lot of material on that, that, uh, those subjects anyway, so uh, we appreciate him doing this, and, and we, uh, you're going to be speaking on the... Uh, a Methodist Church. You, you came out of the Methodist Church, didn't you? No, no. No, but yes. I'll explain that in a minute. Yeah, he's going to explain that in a minute. <laughs> so, come speak to us. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to fill in for Gene. I I have it on good authority that his real problem was that he couldn't uh, wean himself from Facebook long enough to be able to make the trip. <laughs> However, I'm not going to be using his material. I've pulled some material, so whatever you get here will be a bonus to what you have from what he has prepared. As uh, well, as Kenneth pointed out, I still go back to England every year. In fact, we'll leave a week on Monday for my first trip this year. This will be 20 years since we moved back, and this over 20 years since we moved back, and this is my 20th year of going back. Uh, I have to raise the funds, of course, always for this, and appreciate the opportunity to be able to do this. When I was first asked to do this when we left England, I said, I'll see what I can do. Over 20 years, we've been able to do this. But I would particularly ask your prayers for my wife at this time. Because she has serious health issues with the good kind of leukemia. But uh, she can manage to barely take care of herself, but she does, and sleeps a lot. She put something out this morning to say that it was raining hard, good sleeping weather. <laughs> she does a lot of that because of the fatigue. But I would appreciate your prayers for her while I'm, I'm gone. I appreciate the congregation in Belvedere that so graciously allow me to be gone and so willingly the men fill in while I am gone with the work in England. My connection with the Methodist Church goes back many years. The Methodist Church building was at the bottom of the street where I lived, about two minutes' walk. 
And although my parents were officially Anglicans, Church of England, if I went anywhere, it was down the road to the Methodist Church. And during the period of time when I was growing up until the time when I went to Australia, I don't know how many little babies that I became a godfather for. Because according to Methodist teaching, everybody that was in the building when that little one was sprinkled would be a godfather or godmother. When I did leave to go to Australia, I was wanting some references. I was a young man of 19 at the time and going there to get employment. And I asked the local Methodist preacher to write a reference. I got that letter and I looked at it and I thought, this is interesting. Because in that, he said that I was a faithful Christian and several other nice statements like that. Yet I had never placed membership, never gave any indication of being a Methodist. Such is the situation that exists. I want to begin by giving a little bit of history concerning the Methodist Church and then to go into some doctrinal aspects of it as we ask the question and answer it this, morning, this afternoon, what is the Methodist Church? It started out with Methodist societies. What this was was a group of people that would basically meet together for Bible studies, mainly out of the Church of England. It began in about 1729 at Oxford University when the brothers John and Charles Wesley and others began to meet together for these religious exercises. They were referred to as holy clubs. They wanted to overcome what they saw as the formalism and ritualism that was found in the Church of England and thus to stimulate piety and spirituality among the members of the club. The term Methodist came from their scoffers. They had their methods of doing things. And so they arranged a rigorous schedule of duties that had to be performed. Times for visiting the sick and in prison. Times for prayer each day, etc., etc. The more I read about these holy clubs, the more what came to mind was Crossroads Boston with all of the things that they were involved in. It was that same kind of pseudo-spirituality. Later on in time, men began to go about preaching in England. <coughs> Usually they met outside in the fields because very often, the Anglican vicar would not allow them to preach in the church building. And from these Methodist societies, eventually they began setting up their general rules, mostly provided by John Wesley, for the guidance of members. The Book of Discipline, with its 25 articles. And what they did in these early years met together at different times so as to not conflict with the regular Church of England services for some informal preaching, Bible reading, and prayer. They were the ones who started out the idea of circuit preachers, providing a rotation of preachers itinerant going around the country to the various societies. To be part of the society, there were tickets for members in good standing that were issued quarterly, <coughs> the only requirement to get the ticket was a desire to flee from the wrath to come. But it meant the beginning of a lifelong pro process of training in understanding of that particular faith and seeking to grow in what they termed holy living. They were organized also into smaller groups or bands working together, but later on this expanded into what they call a class system, with the entire membership being assigned to mixed groups, each led by a class leader. And this, according to one of their own historians, became the basis 
for a remarkable experiment in intimate Christian community. Their first conference was called by Wesley in 1744 purely as an advisory body. But in 1784, John Wesley took a step that formally put him out of the pale of the Church of England, although he officially remained an Anglican minister and never actually left the Church of England. This was when he ordained two men to go to America to evangelize the Methodist societies in this country. He had first sought to get the Bishop of London to do this, but when he refused, Wesley, relying on his position as a presbyter in the Church of England, ordained them himself. And so in 1784, the Methodist Church in the United States was established, the Methodist Episcopal Church, as those who were ordained by Wesley deigned to call themselves bishops. In England and in Australia and other places, they don't have the Episcopal system. They were superintendents who would be charged with taking care of several preachers in different localities. And hence, when Michael was talking about uh, William Booth becoming the general superintendent of the Salvation Army, later just dropping the superintendent, that's where they got the superintendent from because Booth came out of the Methodist movement. John Wesley was born in 1703 and died 1791, the son of a Church of England, an Anglican minister. As a young child, he survived a fire and regarded himself from that time on as a brand plucked from the burning. Zechariah 3 and 2 was used as the source of that idea. As mentioned before, along with his brother Charles, who's the great hymn writer of Methodism, they began the Holy Clubs. But he became an Anglican preacher, and in 1735, both he and Charles came to the Georgia colony. Two years where they felt they were frustrated, and feeling that his faith was cold and sterile, John returned to London. On the 24th of May, 1738, he attended a meeting at Aldersgate Street in London, where, as he states, that he felt his heart strangely warmed by the sense of his assurance of sins forgiven and the sufficiency of God's grace. Maybe he had heartburn, I don't know. But the context here is that he believed that he received a direct operation of the Spirit, probably some superliterary type of information that called upon him as now being one who was forgiven. That is where he credits the start of himself moving in the direction that he eventually went. Even though they'd been involved with those holy clubs before, this is where it really began. At that point, he took off preaching throughout the countryside on on horseback, and as we indicated, not often being able to use church buildings, preached to the masses in houses, halls, and open fields. And then what became the Methodist societies were then established. Wesley rejected Calvin's theory of predestination, as Michael alluded to yesterday, and affirm the freedom of the human will as prompted by grace. One thing to keep in mind, John Wesley died as an Anglican. He never intended to found a separate denomination. His idea was revitalizing the sterility of the Church of England. As far as the Methodist Church coming into existence, in 1784, in addition to the ordinations that we mentioned a moment ago, another event occurred that was to lead to the establishment of the Methodist Church in Great Britain. This was the deed poll or deed of declaration, which regularized and perpetuated the constitution of the societies. A hundred preachers were appointed as a body which was vested with authority in matters of discipline, administration, and the stationing of preachers. 
This is a practice that was continued and still, as far as I know, doesn't continue, at least in Great Britain. Outsiders say which preacher is going to which congregation and when he's leaving. The congregation has nothing to do with it. And this group was to elect its own new members to fill any vacancies. This became the core of what later was the Methodist Conference. And it was only in 1878 that they brought in those that were not ministers into that conference. After Wesley's death in 1793, it was resolved that these societies should have the privilege of the Lord's Supper, where they unanimously desired to partake of it. And so, after a long discussion, a plan of pacification was drawn up and accepted in 1795 that declared that sacraments, burials, and services in church hours were to be conducted by the preachers only when a majority of the trustees, the stewards, and class leaders of the Methodist chapel approved. This was a crucial step in moving them away further from the Church of England. Until that point, all of those things the Lord's Supper, baptisms, marriages, funerals, all went through the Church of England. And by 1836, the separation was complete. Over the years, there have been various divisions that have occurred, both in this country and throughout the world, although most of them have not really been that much over doctrine. Some of the divisions have since disappeared. The Book of Discipline, although the official creed, is subject to change. For instance, in 1910, the doctrine of total heredity depravity was removed, and they decided the doctrine was false, voting to change the discipline accordingly. Well, I'm glad they decided that it was false. They should have declared another, another few things, at least, to be false. But for the last century or so, Methodism as a whole has drifted into theological liberalism with many in the movement no longer accepting the verbal inspiration of Scripture. I remember many years ago when I was in Kansas, I knew an old retired Methodist preacher who had known the fact that all that was going on now rejected the inspired word of God. The ecumenical movement has taken its toll in some countries where they have been merged into other groups. Methodism have also spawned the holiness movement, the Church of the Nazarene, and others, thus the Pentecostal holiness movement from that. They're bound together basically what is, by what is often referred to as the Wesleyan doctrines. Not Wesleyan as Michael was saying yesterday, Wesleyan. I do appreciate what Michael was doing yesterday, even though I'm having a little bit of fun with him, because he did seek to explain when dealing with the Salvation Army the clear distinction between the teaching of Methodism and Calvinism when it relates to those particular subjects. And I would refer you to either his written material or to the lesson to deal with that, because as he pointed out, Booth came out of the Methodist movement and began the Salvation Army in the East End of London. But let us now move in to look at some of the doctrinal positions, some of the doctrinal teachings of this Methodist group. I want to do it this way. I'm going to ask some questions. Give Methodist answers and then give some Bible response. First of all, concerning the church, is the Methodist church a biblical church? Well, according to their discipline on page three, the Methodist church is a church of Christ in which the pure word of God is preached and the sacraments duly administered. Well, let's look at the Bible. Where in the Bible do you find mentioned the Methodist Church? There is no such organization found within the pages of God's Word. 
Indeed, there were no sacraments mentioned. And even if they were, Methodists do not duly administer them. Another question. Is the church composed of many branches? Notice what Methodism teaches. In the preamble to their constitution, the church is composed of many branches, denominations, and the Methodist church is one branch. Where do they come up with this idea of branches? Well, we go to John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, where Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, and except it abide in the vine, no more could ye except you abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth of a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Who is he talking to here? It's in the Methodist church, and the Baptist church, and the Presbyterian church, and the Roman Catholic church. No, the text tells us he's talking to disciples as individuals. Has nothing to do with having various branches of the church. And we know when we come to a study of the scripture, it doesn't say anything of that nature at all. Matthew 16 and 18. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my churches. No. No. I will build my church. Acts 20, 28. Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. How many churches did the blood of Christ purchase? But one, the Lord's. Romans 12, 4 and 5. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. In writing to the Corinthian brethren, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 1 and 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the old Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Ephesians 4 and 4, There is one body, of one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. Colossians 1.18, Jesus is said to be the head of the church. Now the denominational concept would have Jesus as the head of the church with a multitude of bodies. What kind of horrific picture does that give? But that's what is maintained by many of these denominational groups. Oh, there's just one part, there's just one branch. Christ, the head of the church. We're all churches of Christ, but we all have different doctrines. We could ask, what did Jesus pray for in John 17 concerning his disciples? That they might be one even as he and the Father were one. That's a unity that involves doctrine. You can't conceive of the Father and the Son being divided on any matter of doctrine. With all of these different religious bodies, think that that's quite acceptable. Let's move on concerning authority. What is the authority when it comes to Christianity? In their book of Discipline, Article 362 on page 108, the Methodist discipline gives rules, doctrines, and regulations governing all procedures and affairs of the church, and all ministers are obligated 
to observe every part of it in his district. He may have more than one congregation that he worked with. Well, what does the Bible teach? St. Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for what? Doctrine, for a proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Bible gives us all we need. We don't need a discipline to provide what we need to know to be Christians. And again, 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, according to his divine power, has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. And notice again what Paul wrote to the Galatian brethren, Galatians 1, 8 and 9. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now if their doctrine comes from their book of discipline, it doesn't come from the Bible, therefore it is another gospel. Revelation 22, 18 and 19 tells us that if any man shall add unto these things, shall God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Well, if there's got to be a discipline and a book that provides doctrine, either it is adding to or taking away from what God has be real, and probably in some cases both. What does Jesus say, Matthew 15 and 9? But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. When it comes to organization, let us ask the question, is there any church organization outside the local congregation? Again, the Book of Discipline, Article 4, page 10. This sets forth the organization of the Methodist Church, its powers and duties. Now, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, volume 15, page 303, the highest authority in British Methodism is the annual conference, where they get together and they vote and determine what is to be the policies, the doctrines, the direction of the church. That's where they change things to bring in women preachers and so on. Well, the Bible tells us, Colossians 1.18, that our Lord is the head of the body. And again, Ephesians 1.22-23, put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things, to the church which is his body. We notice with regards to organization, Philippians 1 and 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi together with the bishops and deacons. And Titus 1, 5, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou should set things in order that are in wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, Titus 1, 5 through 11, give qualifications for those to serve as elders or bishops. Now, when you look to the Methodist Book of Discipline, they come up with their own ideas. They certainly are not following what is found within the pages of God's Word. Not only in the organizational structure of the local congregation with its elders and deacons and members, but beyond that, because they have their area circuits. And so there are those who are under that superintendent. Oh, they don't want to have bishops, at least in England. They call them a superintendent. What does the superintendent do? Well, what the bishop would do in the Methodist Episcopal Church in this country. Where do they get that idea from? out of Catholicism and not the Bible. Let's take a moment to think about the matter of baptism. 
and ask the question, is there a choice of modes of baptism? Again, from the book of discipline, let every adult person and the parents of every child to be baptized have the choice of sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. This thing is a Burger King kind of religion. Have it your way. The Bible doesn't say such things. Romans 6, 3, and 4. Know ye not the tremendous which were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Colossians 2 and 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of the Son of God who hath raised him from the dead. And of course we could actually put in there too of Acts chapter 8 concerning the Ethiopian eunuch and as Michael pointed out yesterday, there were those that would say he had a flask of water there that was there in the chariot, and they both got down into that flask of water in order to baptize. I heard a story, too, about a young girl whose pet died, and the father told her he needed to go, who was a preacher, to go out and bury it. So she went out to the garden, laid the dead animal down, got some dirt, and started sprinkling it all over. And he came out to the little girl and said, what are you doing? She said, I'm burying the animal's name. You're not burying it, you're just putting some dirt on top of it. Well, when you preach, you, have, you put some trickles, some drops of water on a baby. And then you talk about being buried in baptism. Such inconsistency. Stuff that is nowhere taught within the pages of God's Word. Again, are infants to be baptized? In Discipline, Article 1910 on page 470 through 474, this is the summation of it. The baptism of infants is justified on the basis that Jesus said, Suffer the children to come unto me. And I remember growing up, going to the Methodist church, and they'd have a christening. And they would sing this song, When mothers of Salem their children brought to Jesus, the stern disciples turned them back and bade them depart. Well, you look at that passage of Scripture. You read it in its context. It's not talking anyone at all about baptism, let alone the baptism of infants. When you go to the Bible, there are no examples of infants being baptized. Oh, but what about the households? Well, does the household have to have a baby in it? <coughs> Dub, you have a household. Does your household have a baby in it now? No. Kenneth? Now, you've got a grandbaby, but it's not your household. One has a household... It doesn't have to include children. But when you read concerning the household of Cornelius and the Philippian jailer's household, what happened when they responded to the gospel? They were able to respond. These little tiny babies don't know how to respond. They said to scream and holler when they're upset or when they're hungry. And that's about all they know. Another question. Can faith be taught after baptism? Notice what the book of discipline says. Parents of the infant are duty bound to teach the infant after baptism concerning our faith. In other words, you baptize them and then you teach them what they're supposed to believe. What did Jesus teach? Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And this also shows that infants are not subjects of baptism. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. They to go teach after they've taught then those who are baptized. You don't teach the little tiny babies. 
I was sprinkled as a babe, not in the Methodist church, but in the Church of England, when I was less than a month old. Same difference. I didn't know what was going on. But according to my baptismal certificate that I still have, and if you go back to the English lectures a few years ago, I've got a copy of it in there, that says I was added to Christ, became a member of the body of Christ, and all of this. In that tiny age of about a month, I knew nothing what was going on. And that's the same thing that happens here. Okay, let's think about preaching for a moment. This is also important, I believe. Do men have to have special permission to preach? Do you or I or any of us of the men have permission have to have special permission from someone before we can preach, go somewhere and preach? According to the Methodist Church. No member of the Methodist Church can preach without a license from an appropriate authority. That would be from whatever conference or section that they're in. They've got to have approval whether they're a full-time preacher or a lay preacher. They have to have a certification. Well, Acts 8 and 4, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. We don't have to do that. Do we? we have the responsibility of teaching and preaching. We don't have to wait for someone to tell us now in a congregation, the elders have a responsibility, as we know, to shut the mouths of those who are preaching false doctrine. And sometimes they have the responsibility of getting someone to quit when time's up. Women, are women to engage in preaching in the service of the church? Women may engage in the ministry of the preaching except as traveling evangelists. We don't have time to look at 1 Corinthians 14, 33, 34, 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15. What about justification by faith? Are men saved by faith only? Well, this is what they teach. Wherefore, that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and full of comfort. James says very clearly that we're not saved by faith only. The only time those two words appeared to it together, James said it ain't so. And again, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. They also teach that both the Old and New Testaments are to be equally obeyed. Just Colossians 2.14 is the only one I will mention at this time. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. What is the Methodist Church? It is clearly a counterfeit church based on their own teachings from their own official documents, their own book of discipline. They have a wrong authority because it's not based on the word of God. They have a wrong organization because it is not the organization that is found within the pages of God's word for the church. They're wrong with respect to baptism. Not only with respect to the fact that they want to sprinkle of poor or immerse or that they want to sprinkle of poor or immerse little babies but they do not baptize for the remission of sins. They're wrong with respect to their preaching for their authorization and for allowing women to preach. But not only that, <laughs> their preachers are wrong because of the doctrine that they teach. They have the wrong faith because they have a faith that is a faith alone, not that faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Hence, the Methodist church is wrong it is counterfeit. It is not the church that our Lord established. Amen. It was established by men nearly 2,000 years too late to be the church that was established on Pentecost. Thank you very much.
seems that the best way to uh, refute a false doctrine is to lay it alongside the doctrine of Christ and see how they compare. I think uh, Ken has done an excellent job of doing that with a Methodist discipline, laying it alongside the uh, New Testament and thereby proving the Methodist discipline to be false. I think he also proved that the uh, English model preaches just as good as the American model. <laughs> we uh, appreciate, Ken, you uh, stepping in on short notice and, and uh, filling in for Gene. And uh, we'll have to check that Facebook. I don't... <laughs> I, was, I was expecting a comment on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't forward it to me, too, please. <laughs> We'll be dismissed now for about 10 minutes and uh, gathered again at the bottom of the